So today let's see what's inside of this battery charger from IKEA. It comes in a very plain box, typical for IKEA. It's called Stenkol and it can charge double A's or triple A's for pieces. So let's take a look at it. It has this plug, a European one, and a space for triple A's or double A's. Now let's take a look at the marking of it. The input is a universal mains voltage and the output is 1.5 volts and 350 milliamps for double A's or 200 milliamps for triple A's for each. And it says that the flashing red light is error, probably a damaged or faulty battery, pulsing white is charging and steady white means fully charged. And of course some warnings, but it doesn't seem to say that I shouldn't open it. So let's open it. But of course before this let's quickly test it. Let's plug it in. Four LEDs blink and nothing. Because I have to put batteries into it and... Now it's charging, it's flashing and the triple A should be also flashing. And it's the fancy pulse with modulated flashing. It has a pulse with modulated brightness and a white LED. It tries to look posh instead of using a red, yellow or green LED with normal flashing. But of course I prefer the red, yellow or green LEDs. And the old green ones are actually yellow green. I prefer those three colors because the new ones, the white, blue and pure green LEDs are quite annoying in the night. It can actually illuminate the entire room when it's dark. And basically the entire room is blinking. Because human eyes in the dark are very sensitive to blue, pure green and also white which contains blue. And that's why I like the yellow indicator of this older charger. But of course it has one big disadvantage. It has just one indicator for all batteries. And occasionally some of the batteries has a poor contact and with just one indicator you don't realize it and only some of the batteries will charge and when you use those batteries in a series the battery which wasn't charged will be destroyed probably. It will discharge it to zero or even into negative voltage basically reversing it and this destroys it. I always check the batteries with my multimeter to verify that all of them are charged. This one is better because it has indicators for each battery, so if there is a poor contact, you recognize it immediately. But of course I diverge too much, and now let's open it. There are two screws. Well, they put Torx screws in it, so you can't easily open it. But of course I have my set of security bits. Let's try this one. And let's open it. And that's it. It's not easy to open. And of course I broke my knife because the gap was too small to insert a screwdriver. But now it kind of opens. It clicks in. And that's it. This is just a piece of plastic. And it seems to be quite nicely built. There are some NTC thermistors to sense the temperature. There is one for each pair of cells. And those actually go into those holes and sense the temperature through the plastic and those negative contacts and it's even marked on the board triple A minus, double A minus and the positive contacts, battery plus and those LED indicators they are white but also they contain red for the error so are those red and white LEDs in one package? probably yes, they have three pins it seems like it's a common positive and a cathode for white and a cathode for red. Quite unusual LEDs, I have never seen this before. 
And the rest of it is a switching power supply with an optocoupler, the fuse here, some auxiliary capacitor. And those are probably the primary side capacitors. They should be 400 volts, 4.7 microfarads, 400 volts. Some interference capacitor here, here, here. Some inductor in some interference filter. And the rectified main is probably goes into one capacitor, then through the inductor and then to the other capacitor. And there is probably the fuse somewhere here. And the secondary side capacitor is here. 220 micro 35 volts. It's quite a high voltage rating. And the other capacitor is 10 volts. It seems that the power supply has two different outputs. One for the charging probably and the other one for some control circuitry. And here of course is the switching transformer on the right core. Probably with an air gap because it's probably a flyback. It's not very powerful. It doesn't have to be anything else than a flyback. And can I take it out? Yes. Those are the cables coming from the plug. And here's the other side of the board, which looks bloody complicated. And a little correction, this one is actually the fuse. This one is the inner rush resistor, but it wasn't easy to tell because it's in a heat shrink. So this section is basically just a switching power supply, a flyback, with some interference capacitor, the main is coming in here, the fuse and inner rush resistor, the bridge rectifier here, the smoothing capacitors on the primary side, it goes into one, then through this interference inductor and the other one then. There are some small components and this switching chip. Some of those resistors might be a current sensing resistor. Some capacitor and resistor probably in the snubber network together with some diode. We don't see the snubber diode. Maybe here. But there have to be another two diodes for the output. And this one is already the secondary side with two bigger diodes for the outputs. Going into those secondary capacitors and some small diode and a capacitor here. And on the primary side some diodes. One of them is probably the part of the snubber network and the other one might be the rectification of the auxiliary winding of the transformer. The voltage sensing is done on the secondary side probably because there is the optocoupler. So it's basically a switching power supply with a chip that contains a built-in high voltage switching transistor. Here are those interference capacitors going from the primary side to the secondary side and they are two in series. And those seem to be class Y1 capacitors. The safest class of safety capacitors, basically. They are the safest ones, probably tested to 8 kV, but still, they put two in series for even more safety. And the rest of it is quite an overcomplicated circuitry with a big chip here, a smaller chip here and multiple other chips. Some six pin chips here, 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 four, five of them. That's a lot. And something that looks like a voltage regulator probably. And some transistors or maybe three pin chips, some diode and lots of resistors and capacitors. And also some zero ohm links here and here, for example. And some very low resistance resistors, probably the current sensing shunts. And those are R100 0.1 ohms, R120 0.12 ohms or 120 milliohms and this one 200 milliohms. And those are probably the current sensing shunts. They seem to be sensing the current through the batteries in the negative side. And this solder joint is a bit weird, with something splashed here and much more solder than the other ones. But otherwise it looks quite nice. Are those chips readable? Let's put some white heatsink paste on them so they are more readable. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it makes it even worse actually. The smaller chip is hard to read. And this one is the voltage regulator probably. 
it helps a bit here and those small six pin chips and they are actually easier to read in a reflection probably and the heat sink paste worked for the bridge rectifier not so much for the main switching power supply chip but it seems to be quite safely built there is a fuse for fire safety there are interference filters, few capacitors with an inductor in between, and those safety interference capacitors, which are even few in series, and also a huge isolation gap on the board. The isolation line between the primary and secondary side goes through here and through here. And this chip seems to be a microcontroller, an 8-bit one, with built-in 12-bit analog to digital converters. And this one seems to be just four op amps in one package. And this one seems to be a voltage regulator, 6U03. And those multiple 6-pin packages seem to be double MOSFETs. There are five of them. They are those. Now let's put the board back into the front panel and let's test it and do some measurements. Now I can plug it in and put some batteries in it. Does it run? Well, one of them doesn't. Is there a poor contact? Probably yes. Well, what's happening? No, it has a good contact, probably. Now let's try to do some measurements. Here should be the rectified mains on the primary smoothing capacitor, about 320 volts DC. And the secondary voltages are... One of the capacitors seem to be nearly 12 volts, and the other one is... It actually keeps changing. So it's probably the charging voltage for the batteries, and... Is it switching between the batteries? because some of those multi-battery chargers are charging one at a time. So here's the low voltage for the battery charging. The other one is almost steady, and it's probably for the control circuitry. But it also fluctuates a bit. Now let's try to measure with no batteries in it. And this one is steady at about 11.6 volts, and the other one is... It's steady at 2.67 volts. Now let's have all four positions loaded. And then this output of the switching power supply has constantly a lower voltage because it's constantly loaded. But if there are just some of the batteries, it's changing because it switches through the batteries. It charges one, then the second one, third one, fourth one, and then the first one again. It charges just one at a time and it runs through them. Let's measure the voltage on one of the batteries. It's 1.3 volts and it occasionally bumps to 1.43. The battery is connected to the charging current just once every two seconds or so. It seems to be a two second cycle where each of the batteries is connected to the charging current for about half a second. So each battery is getting about 25% duty cycle. And those MOSFETs in the 6-pin packages are probably switching the batteries. And now let's try to measure the voltage on one of the batteries using an oscilloscope. He was recently donated this oscilloscope, so huge thanks for the donation. It's really an amazing machine. Of course, I very often prefer an analog oscilloscope, but in this case I'm measuring a slow process, so it's an example of a situation where you need a digital oscilloscope, or maybe an analog oscilloscope with a memory screen. And now there is just one battery in it, and it seems that it's pulsing the battery at about 50% duty cycle. Let's stop it. It's 400 milliseconds per division. I'm still learning how to use this oscilloscope. Now 200 milliseconds and it's five divisions. When I put two batteries in it, it looks the same. It's still 50% duty cycle. Let's put three batteries in it. How does it change? And the duty cycle is now lower. Each battery is getting one third of the time, so it's pulsing at 33% duty cycle, and with four batteries, the duty cycle should be even smaller, about 25%. Let's stop it. Of course, there is a lot of noise. Can I measure two batteries at the same time? Of course, it's only possible if they have common negative. 
but it seems they do have a common negative and now it's basically measuring the voltage at two different batteries at the same time and those go one after another. Now let's connect it to a different battery and now let's call it battery number one and three. If just two batteries are connected, it just alternates between those two. And this is on the current sensing resistor. Now there is just one battery and there is the slow pulsing but also quite a lot of noise. Does it come from the power supply or does it come from the oscilloscope? But let's just try to eyeball the voltage on it. This is the zero level, this marker and this one, the center of it is about two and a half divisions above it. And this is with just one battery. And with two batteries it's on all the time almost, except a short dead time. And with three batteries... And four batteries... It's going through all the batteries with some short dead time in between. But the current seems to be still about the same amplitude. Let's stop it. It's about 500 milliseconds for each battery. Not sure why there is so much noise. What if I zoom it? It seems to be a sawtooth. And with just one battery it's alternating between this sawtooth and this. And of course analog oscilloscope time. One AA battery and connect it to the current sensing resistor. And it alternates between nothing with a little bit of noise on it and this sawtooth. Which is about two or two and a half divisions. And it's again 50 millivolts per division. So it might be about 100 or 125 millivolts when it's active, when it's there in average. And this is basically the switching noise from the switching power supply and the sawtooth is getting progressively more blurry from left to right because the switching power supply probably wobbles its switching frequency to reduce the interference. And of course on an analog oscilloscope I can't zoom it out to the one hertz or half hertz pulsing because it would have to have a memory screen or a long persistence phosphor at least. And this is one of the secondaries of the switching transformer. And the switching power supply alternates between a high load and a light load operation. And the same thing on the digital oscilloscope. Again the lower voltage secondary. And here is the current sensing resistor together with it. And the ripple on it correlates with the switching of the switching power supply. When the power supply is loaded, it runs at a higher frequency and higher duty cycle. Let's try to zoom it in. And zoom it out. And of course this was all done with one AA in it. With more than one battery in it, it's active for most of the time. With just a very short off time or dead time. Let's zoom it out all the way to the slow process. Now it's rolling, and you can see just the short dead time is here. Now let's take a look at how it's sensing the current. It's sensing it in the negative and for the double A's the current sensing resistor is made of this parallel combination, which in total gives this resistance. And for triple A's there is another current sensing resistor added in series to it. And it's again a parallel combination, which in total gives this resistance and... So for triple A's, this total resistance applies. It's the grand total of those four resistors. And basically all four negatives for the double A's are common, but... There is another group of four negatives for the triple A's. As you can see, there are basically separate contacts for double A's and separate contacts for triple A's. But there is just one positive for each battery. And the positive contacts are not common together. They are switched using the MOSFETs. And the voltage drop on those resistors I was measuring was about 100 to about 125 millivolts. Let's call it 115 millivolts or 0.115 volts. And the current should be the voltage divided by the resistance. So let's divide the voltage drop 
by the resistance of those resistors and it gives about 1.72 amps. But of course this is the peak current, but if there are four batteries one of them gets about 25% of it in average because it's charged for one quarter of the time, but there is also some dead time so let's call it 22% or 0.22. So this peak current times 0 0.22 is about 0 0.378 amps or 378 milliamps. And the marking says 4 times 350 milliamps for double A's, which is not really that far from it. And for triple A's it uses those two parallel combinations in a series and this total resistance and if I put this resistance into the formula, it gives this peak current about 0 0.9 something amps. And again, this multiplied by 22% duty cycle or 0 0.22 gives 208 milliamps. Which is also very close to this 200 milliamp rating for triple A's. And the voltage drop on those current sensing resistors is sensed through the op amp. And when it's charging it probably regulates the switching power supply such a way that this voltage drop is roughly something like this. And the higher voltage from the switching power supply about 12 volts goes into this voltage regulator and at the output there is about 5 volts. And this voltage from the regulator probably powers this microcontroller. And of course a little correction, this one is not a capacitor for interference suppression, it's actually a metal oxide varistor for over voltage protection. And here is the input section of it, and this one is the metal oxide varistor, not a capacitor. And very often in small switching power supplies, the electrolytic capacitors double up as main smoothing and interference filter. There is basically a parallel capacitor, a series inductor and another parallel capacitor. And one more correction, those two big diodes are actually both in a parallel, both for the low voltage high current output for the charging. And for the higher voltage, 12 volts and very low current, just for the control circuitry, there is just this small diode. Now the question is, what if I stick some non-rechargeable batteries in it? Does it charge them? Well, it doesn't. It recognizes it and it blinks those red LEDs. Now let's try to measure the battery voltage and the voltage drop of the current sensing shunt while inserting the battery. Now inserting the rechargeable battery, it brings the voltage down and then it starts pulsing current into it and also the voltage bumps up. Now removing it and putting a non-rechargeable battery in it and it refuses to charge it. It was a zinc carbon or zinc chloride battery. Now let's try a non-rechargeable alkaline battery. It tries to charge it but in just short pulses. So that's Stenkol nickel metal hydride battery charger from IKEA, which charges the batteries in half a second pulses. But this one seems to do basically the same. And of course thanks to all of my patrons on Patreon and you can also become my patron to support my channel and get early videos and the link to my Patreon is in the description as well as the link to my Instagram. And of course you can also subscribe to my channel. And I also plan to take a look inside of this ultrasonic humidifier or ultrasonic mist generator.